The following episode of Jordan's Soapbox contains mentions of domestic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Attention guests in the luggage claim area, welcome to the Jordania Volcano Hotel. A couple of quick reminders before you approach the elevator towards the lobby. Jordan Soapbox is a show broadcasted on site and supported via Patreon. If you would like to support what I do and not cause the country of Jordania economic ruin, consider supporting it for behind the scenes access and other rewards. It's recommended to frequent visitors subscribe to the channel and ring the bell for updates whenever new videos are made. Do you want to hang out with your fellow guests? Consider jacking in to the Cyberpunk Jordan Discord, where you can hang out with me and talk about Sonic and Sega stuff, among other things. And now, our elevator shaft will be departing for the lobby area. Thank you for your attention and enjoy your stay. Hello, my gummy bears. My name is Jordan, also known as CJ, and welcome back to Jordan's Soapbox, the show that talks about anything that I want to talk about. In the classic 14th century literature, The Divine Comedy, Dante and Virgil descend into hell, which is composed of various circles that are progressively worse as they go on. In much the same way, as we've covered with Archie Sonic, We've been progressively getting into worse circles of hell with this series. From the baffling crossover with Image Comics to the utter war crime of Sonic 150-151, I really thought we plunged into the darkest depths with this series. I was wrong. Because Sonic the Hedgehog 134 exists. This issue might seem familiar if you're a longtime viewer of Jordan's Soapbox. I've frequently mentioned it, and referenced that one scene, as one of the worst issues of this series. And it is. But why is it one of the worst? Well, I'm gonna talk about it. But before we do that, we need to talk about this issue in context. And to do that, we need to talk about Carl Ballers. Carl Ballers was the former head writer of Archie Sonic from around 1999 to 2005. That's because Ken Penders was more working on Knuckles the Echidna and something else that's gonna be for next time. Like Ken Penders, his contributions to the comic are immeasurable for both good and ill. During the early 2000s, he wrote the Tossed in Space arc that resulted in Sonic being flung on an intergalactic adventure due to the events of the Quantum Dial. The follow-up was Home, which focused on the events of Sonic returning from Mobius after a year-long absence. At least in Mobian time, it was only a couple weeks or something for Sonic. It's kind of confusing, just go with it. It allowed the comic to have a soft reboot of sorts, introducing numerous changes for future stories, which is what this thing is. It's a low stakes story, which is fine given the high intensity of previous issues, that sets up a ton of different ideas that can be for future issues of the comic. Unfortunately, some of those ideas turned out very differently, were incredibly bad, or a combination of both. But before anything else, I want to start off with the art of Sonic the Hedgehog 134, which marks John Gray as the main artist for our issue. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he would be a familiar face with Archie Sonic and its successor, IDW Sonic. He's known for having a really fun style that's cartoony but incredibly detailed with tons of Easter eggs and references. I overall adore his art and he can, and thankfully continued, to do cool stuff. But to debut as a professional artist in one of the worst issues of this comic is just soul crushing to me. It also doesn't help, his style doesn't really fit the more serious tone of the issue. He deserved better, and so did we. Anyway, our story actually begins proper with Sonic being treated by Dr. Quack at the Royal Infirmary for his injuries last issue, and examining an alien implant from the Tossed in Space arc, as you do. Dr. Quack thinks this would be more harm than good to remove, so Sonic is sent on his way with some medication. Is there any medication that I can have so that way I don't have to suffer through this nightmare of an issue? No. Okay. 
But the doctor looks worse for wear, and it's revealed Dr. Quack had a nasty encounter with a landmine while tending to the wounded. Hey, that's an interesting change for a long-running character, but, uh, oh, we're, we're already moving on to something else? Uh, Okay, uh, to be fair, Dr. Quack is a supporting character, so maybe we don't need to dwell on it too much. Sonic returns home with his family, where it's discovered the alien implant allows him to talk to Mutsky, well before the changes in the post-Super Genesis wave. I'm still not quite over that. As Sonic runs down to his family to tell them of the discovery, he quickly changes the subject and remembers his encounters with the alien race known as the Bem. Did... Did I have this comic on fast forward or something? Seriously, d did I? Regardless, Sonic explains a scientist from that race was responsible for de-roboticizing all of Mobius with some exceptions, most notably Jules, which by the way is Sonic's dad. Get over it. Jules, as it turns out, can never be de-roboticized, as the injuries he sustained during the Great War were so severe that if they did so, he would die. It's overall a shocking and somber revelation that Sonic's father can never be flesh and blood again, which immediately ends with Mutsky saying, well, that solves that? What? Ugh, yeah, if you haven't noticed a pattern by now, Sonic 134 has a ton being thrown at you without taking the time to really have those moments have meaning or impact, which should take a couple of panels at least, or a couple of pages at most, are abruptly ended to move on to the next thing. For instance, the moment where Sonic reveals to Tails that his long-thought dead parents were actually alive on the alien planet Argentinum. Really a moving scene, and it just ends with the text box, well, my job here is done. No, it isn't. You spend the time to make this moment impactful. This is a huge character revelation for one of the core cast of this comic. The issue is full of examples like this. It's pointless to criticize it every time it occurs, but it wrecks havoc on giving these moments their due weight and the overall pacing of the issue, which just feels rushed. We move on to a concert from Mina Mongoose, where King Acorn comes with an important announcement. No, not that important announcement. That's another announcement. This announcement is that they will be departing for a world tour, and Sally Acorn is in charge as acting regent. And immediately after that, Mine and Sonic are reunited, and the comic introduces... Ash Mongoose. <sighs> this character has got to be one of my least favorites out of all of Archie Sonic. There's certain characters like Monkey Con that I love to hate and joke about on this show, but I honestly think that he's a good character. I can't do the same for Ash Mongoose, a character who is so devoid of personality other than being an edgy foil for Sonic. And we haven't even gone to that yet. He wouldn't be remotely interesting until much later in the comic's life, but even then, it has an element of why do you exist? Well, um... He actually no longer exists, because we issued a Jordania extermination order and threw him into the sun. So now he's dead as a doorknob. Yee. Focusing away from violations of the Geneva Conventions, a similarly egregious violation is the notable change in Antoine. Buddy and Antoine, along with Sonic and Sally, have been one of the longest running couples in this comic. But during Sonic's absence in space, the war with Dr. Eggman changed Antoine to a different man, Mobian, which resulted in the two splitting. In fairness to Ballers, the twist with it being anti-Antoine or Patch was not the intention here. It was supposed to be Antoine who was hardened by the war. The scar was actually from a humorous situation with a banana peel? Alright, I, I can dig that. Who would eventually be corrupted by the source of all the basic building block of the universe, basically this giant pile of goop. Which is interesting, and it's far better than what we ended up having, but did we really want this? I mean, seriously, did we really want Antoine with a Chucky-like face? Ugh! Get that thing away from me. And then we get to the moment you've all been waiting for. Sally requests Sonic rule by her side while her parents are away, with Sonic pointing out who would fight Dr. Eggman in his absence. Because although Sally is correct in that there are many other heroes willing to fight Dr. Eggman, none have had quite 
the amount of success as the blue blur. Sally should know this considering all the adventures that they've been through. In some fairness, Sally was dealing with trauma because she, like everyone else, thought Sonic was dead during his time in space, and nearly died again when he was injured last issue. But she still seems to be suffering from some sort of memory loss here from their previous experiences. So is it any surprise that when Sally asks him to do so, Sonic respectfully says no? And then Sally slaps Sonic with the immortal words, I should have known you would be this selfish. This is it. This is the image that basically defined everything wrong with Archie Sonic for a lot of folks and continues to be brought up in arguments against it. It would be the start of the gradual decline of this comic, although one could argue it might have been occurring earlier than this. I have stated before how important Sonic and Sally are to this series. Their relationship is the equivalent of Superman and Lewis Lane. And in one fell swoop, they burnt one of the couples that held this comic together. And arguably did so twice with Bunny and Antoine for the flimsiest of reasoning. It also burned the love that Sally Acorn had, a fan favorite character that, may I need remind all of you, was so popular that both the fans and Sega wanted her back after the whole Endgame stuff. Instead, they would have likely wanted her to stay dead. She would be insufferable both in this issue and beyond. It essentially threw away decades worth of stories that built up this character in favor of a version of a character that's just such a pale comparison. It would be years until Ian Flynn took command to write this sinking ship, both literally and metaphorically. I've heard it said that yes, Sally Acorn was suffering from trauma, so this is kind of excused, but I said this in a comment with Fiona Fox, dealing with physical emotional trauma cannot be an excuse to harm others. I'm someone who's the victim of emotional trauma myself from a previous relationship, so it's very personal to me. I'm sorry, I have to be blunt with this. This scene is an example of domestic violence. It's Sally assaulting Sonic with a hard slap on the face in front of loved ones and friends. I do not care whether you're a man, a woman, non-binary, you don't do this to your partner. It's borderline, think of the children, but I really don't care here. For an all-ages comic to have this is completely out of line. And the idea that kids, as impressionable as they may be, may think that this is an acceptable way to treat someone they love when an argument or disagreement like this occurs is horrifying. Was that the intention? No, of course not. But it's nevertheless why you have to think about your intended audience and be careful as such. It's the same thing I said with Penders. It's the same thing I'm going to say here. That actually leads us into this. Returning to the post-134 ideas Ballers had for this series, of which there's a long list, I'll link it in the description, the idea behind this was somehow even worse. Sonic would have had a completely different team composed of Tails, Amy, Bunny, and Fiona. Sally would have been effectively sidelined, and in terms of romantic interests, after some apparently romantic shenanigans, Sonic would have ended up with Amy. I've talked about how I feel the couple could have worked in the Archie Sonic continuity, but not like this. None of the expense of one of the comic's core couples, both romantically and friendship-wise, and worse, to sideline a fan favorite character? Seriously? The fact that this was considered shows a complete disconnect to me between the staff of Archie Sonic and readership. Because while I don't speak for everybody, I sure as heck didn't want this. I don't think anybody wanted this. While these ideas never came to fruition, the breakup between Sonic and Sally still went ahead, which itself is absurd and lasted nearly 100 issues. Perhaps if the ideas that Ballers had came to fruition, maybe this comic would have been looked at differently. Maybe. But in most cases, they weren't. And if they were, I still doubt this would change the overall issue's quality. Because Sonic 134 is terrible. But not in the way Sonic 150 and 151 is. That is a blip on the radar because it didn't really have any long-term effects for this comic. This did. Sonic and Sally's relationship ended here. It would go on to form one of the stupidest focuses on romance I have ever seen and effectively killed romance in this comic and the successor because of it. It would result in so many dumb storylines for future issues we're inevitably gonna cover on this show. But here's the thing. In a surprising twist, there would be future stories. 
there would be future issues of this comic. More stories would be told, and things would eventually get better. I mean, granted, we had to suffer through a lot of bad first, but hey, it did get better. I want to tell you guys for a second why I started covering Archie Sonic on Jordan's Soapbox. I started doing this because anytime I ever heard about Archie Sonic online, it would always be bare minimum basics like the slap. But Archie Sonic's more than that. It wasn't only dumb and romantic moments like this. It's a beautiful tapestry of some of the best and worst this blue blur had to offer. Because while we will descend into some deep lows with this series such as this issue, there are fantastic highs both before and after this. I think to conclude, let me offer some additional commentary from John Gray on drawing the slap. Quote, I wear that scarlet letter proudly because regardless of the motives behind it, Regardless of the fervor it caused, and regardless of the rancor it still incites Archie Sonic fans with to this day, that in the end is what art, bad or good, which is subjective depending on the eye of the beholder, is supposed to do. It'll make you care about the characters. And the results of this page either made many fans either realize they stopped caring altogether, or made other fans realize that things needed to change, and soon. So I guess that's exactly what this page, warts and diarrhea, and abnormally giant head-eating Sally and all accomplished, and still does. And that to me, makes this issue worth revisiting. At a distance. Fall by a prompt burning. And that's all for this episode of Jordan's Soapbox. Join us next time as we take a flyer into the future with Mobius, 25 years later. Promises were meant to be broken. Thank you for visiting the Jordania Volcano Hotel. We hope that you'll visit again soon. Before you leave, would you like something from our gift shop? Becca has the latest and totally not looted goods from all over the world. One item of note is the subscribe button coming from the US state of California. It works best when you ring its bell and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode of Jordan's Soapbox. We also have a limited edition video that we also think you might like and a collection of Jordan Soapbox episodes in a playlist. All for the price of... Wait a minute. Free? We're giving this out for free? Becca, we are bankrupt!